Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Okay, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today we are going to be looking at the hierarchy of insecticides. Uh, we'll just do a bit of introduction things while everyone uh, gets sorted and joins, um, and then we'll get on with it. Today we are going to be looking at why we need to control insects, uh, the hierarchy of insecticides. We're going to discuss a bit about risk assessing and much more. It's great to see you all joining today. Uh, and just a quick heads up, next month, I will be back on the 7th of July uh, with another webinar on understanding fogging and ULV treatments. So don't miss that one. Just some updates. Um, on June the 21st, uh, there is the Scotland Forum uh, up in Glasgow. Uh, so if you've not registered for that, head over to the BPSA website uh, and register. It will be great to see you all there. There's been a lot of work done recently on member benefits. You'd see some updates on social media and things. Uh, there's now things like 10% off cards for B&Q through the trade point, um, and that's available to all members. Uh, we've got up to 20% off on Dell products. So if you need any uh, computer products, and uh, that's accessories as well, um, there is up to 20% off on them. And we've also launched uh, just recently, I think it was this week or last week, uh, ability to now book a one hour consultation uh, with leading industry experts for health and safety advice, technical support, and um, things like marketing and communications as well. There are much more to come. So this is just uh, a start um, and we'll keep updating these as these member benefits come on. Friendway in Northern Ireland, there is currently a consultation process going on for bird licensing. Uh, the BPC have going to complete the consultation as well, but we'd just like to encourage any members um, that are in Northern Ireland to partake in it. The deadline for any submissions is the 21st of July, uh, and you can again find more information on that on the BPCA website. Okay, for today, uh, there is one CPD point available. Um, so if you've logged in, filled out your details, uh, the points will be added to your relevant scheme automatically for you. If you are not watching this live and you're watching it on social media afterwards, um, you can go on and add your own points for that as they won't be added automatically if you're not watching it live. Um, there is a chat section. I see some of you using it already. Uh, if you have any technical queries or anything like that, put it in the chat section. Uh, one of the staff team in the background will hopefully be able to support you with that. Normally, any sort of technical issues, it's a case of turning it off and then turn it back on again um, and then carry on from there. Additional to the chat section, there is a Q&A section. If you do have any questions, stick them in the Q&A section. Uh, and if we get time towards the end, uh, then we will answer these as well. Just to give you an update on the charity of the year, this year it is Dementia UK. It's the BPCA supporting Dementia UK. We've had a number of different things um, throughout the year already. And in May, some of the staff team completed the 100K uh, run in May challenge. Um, so if you'd like to donate it towards a charity this year, that would be fantastic. Okay. Let me share this. Okay, hierarchy of insecticides then. I just need to move that. Okay, hierarchy of insecticide uses then. So for every job, uh, sorry, every insect control that we do, uh, it'll have slightly different elements to it. Um, and this will uh, affect either the application method, the products you're going to use, or even the outcome of the treatment. So some jobs may be more difficult than others. Um, take, for instance, like a clean house, if you're controlling bed bugs, uh, it may be easier to treat that house if it was free of clutter um, than a house that was maybe more cluttered, for instance. Um, so every job's going to be slightly different and every job uh, will have different parameters and what you need to look for. Uh, but we also need to have a controlled approach to doing these. This is where sort of the hierarchy of insecticide comes into. Um, and today we're going to try and cover sort of all the common questions that we get asked, um, especially around insecticide usage and things like that. And I'll try to give you a, a bit about sort of my experiences um, and sort of how I go about um, carrying out these jobs. And for me, it's always been about having a good routine. Um, so from getting on that site for the first visit, right way through to doing the treatment to the completion, I always try and have sort of set steps that I like to achieve. And I guess it's a bit like, um, you know, athletes, when they 
have a 10 second run on a hundred meters, they might spend hours prepping for that little bit of, um, you know, that, that short period. So that preparation uh, is really key um, when it comes to this. Uh, and getting that preparation right normally gives a better outcome to the treatment. So if you get that, that presentation spot on at the start of it, um, it normally makes the treatment a lot easier um, and a lot more fluid uh, in how you progress through the treatment. So the agenda for today, uh, we're going to look at why we need to control insects. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. We're going to look at the hierarchy of insecticides, talk a bit about risk assessing, uh, managing customer expectations. We'll discuss non-targets as we go through this, and we will look at insecticide resistance. Um, we're also going to discuss a bit about application methods uh, and some more information around active ingredients. Um, and I say these are the things that I normally get asked about, so I, I thought I'd include it in this section uh, as it's all related to insecticides. So why do we need to control insects then? There's lots of different reasons, uh, and we'll start off with obviously disease spread. And disease come in different forms. So you've got things like viruses, such as yellow fever for mosquitoes. Um, you've got sandfly fever from things like sandflies. You can also get bacterias, um, such as the plague, uh, which is obviously spread by fleas. Um, protozoas, so these are things like malaria um, from mosquitoes, sleeping sickness from tsetse flies. Um, uh, insects such as cockroach and flies uh, can spread disease through contamination. So their lifestyle is uh, bringing them in contact with unhygienic environments, drains, feces, um, sewage plants, uh, that kind of thing. And then they're moving from them environments into a clean environment. You know, it could be a house, it could be a hotel or a kitchen, um, but they're, they're bringing that bacteria in from there. Uh, these diseases are normally spread by the insects are usually bacteria. And you've got things like dysentery, gastroenteritis, salmonella, um, typhoid, uh, and these can come up in like sort of boils and abscesses as well. Uh, we then got allergies and phobias. People are generally scared of them and people have different tolerances. Uh, I wouldn't like any pest in my house. Um, and it always amazes me when I go to some uh, properties and they've got a bad pest issue. And I'm, how oh, can you live with this for so long? Um, so different people have different tolerances to phobias, I guess. Uh, but allergies, there are a number of different allergies, uh, things like cockroaches, um, their cast skins and the droppings can remain in that environment even after the treatment's been done. Um, and there was a case in America where people have had uh, health issues from exposure to that, um, then particles being disturbed, uh, and then that's caused them sort of respiratory issues. Um, and there's been studies done on this as well, where people that are exposed, especially um, you know, children with asthma and things like that, they can be exposed to these cockroach allergens and they can suffer more flare-ups um, from that exposure. Um, brown tail moth caterpillar, you know, the hairs break off. These can cause, cause severe skin irritations and rashes um, and they can get embedded in clothes and things like that. Uh, you've got house dust mites. Again, a pest that's quite hard to control. Um, house dust mites themselves, the dead bodies, the fecal matter, uh, can all cause allergic response. And it's becoming more common nowadays, um, and it's more common, especially younger children. We've then got stings and bites. Uh, so wasps and bees, you know, things like anaphylactic shock and Kunis syndrome, if you leave them alone, um, they tend not to cause too many problems, uh, but that is a risk associated with them, especially if you've got wasps in like a beer garden, um, you know, people are trying to waft them out of the way and things, especially later in the season, uh, could um, could be a problem. Um, and with these things, with stings and bites, everyone react differently. So some people can react immediately to it. Some people it can take days or even weeks. Um, I think someone did a presentation not long ago and uh, her husband feeds himself on bed bugs as part of their work. Um, and uh, it takes him two weeks to come up uh, in a bite mark. So it, it can delay quite a lot uh, with different people. And everyone will have a different level of inflammation from it. Um, you know, it's someone that might get stung might have very little reaction, whereas someone could have, uh, you know, more serious uh, consequences to that. And we've got things like physical contamination. So this is insects that are maybe in a, um, uh, a calf and they're landing in soups and drinks and things like that. Uh, that would be more physical contamination. 
Structural does it damage? Um, so structural material damage. Insects such as furniture beetle, death watch beetle, um, house longhorn beetle, even wasps. I remember having a, 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 a hospital and the wasps were actually eating the timber from the window frames, um, and you could see where they'd caused significant removal of timber, and it was actually blowing in through the windows when they opened the windows as well. Um, so the larvae of these insects. Uh, the beetles especially are attracted to the sweet substances and the sugars that are contained within the timber. Um, and with wood boring insects, the larvae can spend up to 14 years. I think the death watch beetle is the longest uh, where it stays in a larval form within that uh, material. Um, and they'll create tunnels that run up and down the grain of the timber. And they all prefer something slightly different. So like death watch beetles will prefer more um, hardwoods like oaks and things like that. Food spoilage, I kind of kept these two separate between contamination uh, and food spoilage. Um, and when I've always done treatments, I find food spoilage is more down to um, like store product insects. So they're actually spoiling that product rather than it just something be landed in it and contaminate it as it were. Um, and food spoilage can be just a small amount of product or it can be you know a, a whole grain store maybe. Then we've got legislation. Um, this is normally in place uh, to enforce control of insects infestations so humans are not put uh, at risk of some of the diseases that I mentioned earlier. And this is mainly aimed at food sites, um, especially the Food Safety Act and these regulations within, and it'll cover everything uh, that deals with food. So it could be a van in a lay-by right the way through to a large manufacturing facility. Um, you then got things like the Environmental Protection Act, uh, this covers everything from electronic bird scarers, waste disposal, um, and even pests in home, uh, in home, sorry. Um, so it, it can fall into that one as well. Public Health Act, keep premises free of vermin. Uh, you then got the rag, rag flock and other filling materials regulations, 1981. And this is any filling material um, has to be kept free of vermin. And the vermin within that legislation is eggs, larvae, pupae, and any parasites. Um, is classed as vermin under that regulation. And then you've got the Food Safety Act 1990. This isn't directly linked to pest control as such. It's more about um, you know, how it's uh, put into practice. So it's environmental health officers um, will use uh, the Food Safety Act to, put implement, to implement standards uh, into making a site better um, or removing a pest problem. And then you've got the Clean Neighbours and Environments Act 2005, uh, and this is used for insects that are coming from a neighbouring property, maybe. So this could be a landfill site that has a large problem with flies. It's now affecting you know, a neighbouring property like a bakery or another industrial site, maybe, um, or even homes. Um, so they, they can all fall under something slightly different. So integrated pest management, uh, something you'll see all over the place now, integrated pest management. It's just using different techniques uh, to achieve control of that pest. So you've got proof in housekeeping, you've then got non-chemical control and then chemical control. Um, if you use integrated pest management, you'll use a different technique uh, and the focus on sort of pest prevention, pest reduction, and then eliminating the conditions that lead to a pest infestation. If you can do that before you even get a pest problem, then you remove the problem in the first place. If you do get a pest problem, you then start looking at removing uh, and implementing these things to prevent it happening in the future. It is quite rare by just doing one of these, it will work. Um, so you may have to use a number of different solutions to treat a problem. Um, and for each site, you may have a different solution from you know, one of these three sections, as it were. Uh, just take fruit fly, for instance. Um, if you didn't fix a leak under the bar and carry out that proofing work, you'd probably always going to have that larvae there and just treating the adults with an insecticide maybe it is not going to work um, efficiently. So you're going to have to use a number of different techniques to control these problems. Uh, expanding this a little bit further, um, we then have the risk hierarchy and that's going to give us guidance on how we use these and how we use these def different techniques to you know, protect non-targets. Um, it also means that things like insecticides are then protected for the future because we're using them properly and professionally, um, and we're carrying out all the steps we need to to eradicate these infestations. Um, 
if we just use the insecticides and we didn't actually get rid of the source of the problem and carry out that proofing and housekeeping work, you know, there's a chance there of building up resistance and things like that. And then products are going to become obsolete. So it all works uh, together to get rid of the problem and create a proper solution. Okay. So risk hierarchy then. Like I say, this will be specific for every site. Uh, and the control techniques will be appropriate for that site, won't, may not be appropriate for a different site. Um, so the risk hierarchy will be unique, um, but you still kind of follow the same principles when you're looking at it. So you always look at the environmental controls first, um, and then your physical controls, and then your chemical controls. And this gives us a structured approach to best achieve control uh, of the pest problem, along with protecting non-targets, and that could be you, it could be people in the property, uh, or even non-target animals as well. And like I said, it's going to be unique for every site. Um, and the next few slides, um, you know, sort of in no particular order, uh, but it's just, you know, the sort of uh, appropriate steps to take to achieve that control. So identification, identification is really important when we talk about insect control. If you don't get the correct identification, it may lead to a unsuccessful treatment or it may, um, you know, allow the problem to continue longer than you'd expect it to. Things like bed bugs, um, you know, it could be confused with maybe a martin bug, and that has a different source. So a bed bug might have been transported by secondhand furniture or, you know, by someone uh, staying in a hotel or going on holiday maybe, um, whereas a martin bug is going to be coming from a bird's nest. So that misidentification um, could cause the treatment to fail or not treat the appropriate areas. Okay, flies again, um, like I say, it's really important to get identification right to find that source. Uh, the green bottle is quite a, a one that I, I talk about quite a lot. Um, and I did a site many years ago where I went in and there was some green bottles or what I thought were green bottles in a living room. And it was a bit, there was nothing really there for it to be a blue bottle problem, a green bottle problem, sorry. Um, and it was only through a bit of investigation that I actually find it was green cluster flies. So by misidentifying it, you can miss the source of the problem and you might not be looking for a food source. You might actually just be looking for, in that case, um, there were green cluster flies that were in the, in the chimney space. Um, so yeah, getting that identification right is key. This is something that crops up a lot this time of year, um, getting call outs for cockroaches, going and finding it's, um, you know, Maybug or June bug, cockchafer. Um, that misidentification, uh, you know, People think these are cockroaches, you go out and it's not. Um, so yeah, it's, it's one that's quite common. And then fleas. Fleas is probably the most common one that I get asked questions about. Um, and it varies from things like, I can't find any activity, what do I do? Uh, right the way through to, can you spray just in case? Um, uh, and things like that. So it's really important to identify these pests to allow you to select the most appropriate control uh, and products that you're going to use to carry out that work. Don't forget the product label is law. Um, and if it doesn't say something like can be used as a precautionary treatment, then you can't just spray a property because someone thinks they have a pest issue. Um, you need to follow that product label and make sure that what you are treating, because you've correctly identified it, um, is then uh, on that product label for you to use that product against it. Okay, managing customer expectations. Um, so it's really important to be honest with your customer. Um, I used to try and avoid the awkward questions of like, can you do it in one visit or, you know, how long is this going to take? Uh, and, you know, try and be as honest, but as open as well with them, with the answers. Um, and it is difficult uh, in some situations, like I say, every site will be completely different. If you carry out your survey and you do a good survey, and, yeah, and you find things like um, you've got a cockroach infestation, uh, they're quite established in a site and there's lots of void spaces that have got easy access to, you know, pass that information on to your customer. Let them, let them know, you know, how bad the infestation is and give them a realistic idea of, you know, what they're dealing with as well. Um, you could even write in your report, you know, I don't remember having an insect job as much, but I definitely had rodent jobs where I'd wrote into the report exactly what I'd found and what I thought was the issue. Um, and because it had taken a little bit longer than maybe uh, would have liked it to because things weren't rectified, um, you know, it was in that report and the customer was aware that, you know, well, these are the things we, that need to be done. Um, and that gives them a bit better understanding. 
also in terms of uh, you know if you've got a site that has a long standing issue um, then reports if a, like an environmental health officer goes in they'll pick up the reports they'll have a read through you know see what's been done in the past um, and then look at what needs to be implemented moving forward and it saves a lot of time as well I've had a lot of uh, sites where EHO have gone in they've looked at the report and thought well, actually they're doing everything they should be um, and then you know it, it makes it a lot easier for uh, for them situations. So openly discuss the solutions, you know, talk to your customers, tell them what options uh, are available um, and, you know, provide clear timelines where possible. So, you know, if something's not going to happen that day, let them know, you know, just say, oh, I'll, I'll come back and do that bit uh, on the follow-up type of thing. Um, but just provide clear timelines with them uh, and sort of keep them on side as it were. Like I said, be transparent and as honest as possible, uh, but remain optimistic and realistic. You know, tell them what's going on, you know, give them some advice on how it's going to look like over the coming period. And a classic one of this is ants. Um, I remember doing ant treatments and the, you'd put gel down for, for ants and then the next day you'd get a phone call. Um, there's still loads of ants everywhere. Well, yeah, the feeding on the bait, that's going to then uh, take it back to the nest and hopefully get rid of the problem. So, you know, tell them that it's going to take two weeks. You'll still see ants for a couple of weeks and then it'll tail off. Um, but give them a realistic picture of what is going to, what it's going to look like. Uh, and then follow up regular, you know, do them follow ups. And your follow ups will differ from site to site. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that uh, in a couple of slides. Um, but make sure you talk about your follow ups and, you know, what they need to do between jobs as well. So I mentioned your surveys are a really important part of insect control and carrying out that de detailed survey uh, will give you a step up um, on carrying out the treatment. Looking for that source of infestation. So find the source. It'll give you a lot of information. Um, you know, if you can identify the pest species, it'll point you to a source. Uh, look for that source. And if you can establish where the source of infestation is coming from, that's going to help you massively with your treatment um, and how quick you can gain control of that and also stop it happening again in the future. Look for the extent. So this is how widespread the infestation is. Now let's take bed bugs, for instance. If you found them in a bedroom, it's important to look at other, other rooms. So think where people take, um, you know, clothes and bed linen. They go out of the bedroom into the kitchen or uh, pantry. Um, they get washed and then they go back again. So think about them transport routes. Same with commercial premises. You know, if it's a hotel, they take that bed linen out. It will go into a laundrette system maybe. Um, and then there's a, a route of where it's going to be. It might be, uh, you know, carts that it goes and things like that. So it might not be that they need control, but you may want to monitor them just so you can make sure that infestation is not spreading as you carry out your treatment. Okay, the degree of the infestation then. So this is how serious or important the infestation is. And normally we look at this as like very light, light, moderate, heavy, or very heavy. Um, and I remember getting a phone call one day for a pub um, and it was, oh, I think we've got light cockroach infestation. Uh, so I, on a Sunday afternoon, I, I drove up to this pub to have a look um, and there was like cockroaches walking through all the food and the mashed potato and, um, and it was quite a heavy infestation. Uh, so just be mindful if someone says one thing, you know, go and have a look at it and see the degree of that infestation and, and have your own opinion on how bad it actually is. Um, don't forget to look in the pest control folder as well. So if it's a new site to you, uh, you know, have a look in the, the pest control folder that's already there. Um, or if you're covering for a technician, maybe, you know, have a look in the folder, see what they've done, see what they've found. Uh, and that might, might, may give you a bit of a picture on where to start looking. Don't always take it as gospel. Um, they may have looked in different areas to you, uh, but yeah, it might give you a bit of a picture on where things are, have been happening in, in the past. Also any products of you. So it might be that you've gone back because there might've been resistance. You might be able to find out what products to use and that may guide you down a different control um, while you're on that site. Uh, food and harborage, again, really important for controlling pest issues. If you can identify these areas, again, it could mean you're gaining control quicker. If you can remove that food and harborage from them, um, you know, it's going to give you a better option to control them. Um, and especially things like um, cockroaches, fruit flies, mosquitoes, you know, finding that source of the infestation uh, is going to be key. Uh, of where the harborage is. Uh, Pre-treatment requirements. Again, this is something that 
could be in a treatment plan. You know, if you've got a contract with someone, um, say for bed bugs, you could have a uh, pre-treatment requirements in there, or it may be something that you verbally speak to a tenant about, or you know, a customer, um, and just say, look, before we come to this treatment, could you please uh, and try and get them, you know, a head start on it. Um, I've done loads of jobs where I've gone to them, asked them to, you know, move things so that we can get in to do a treatment. Uh, and it does help when you get there that that work's already done. And then identify um, control and proofing. So areas of control and proofing, areas for control and proofing. Um, once you've gathered all this information, you can start looking at areas that you're then going to treat um, and any sort of proofing work that needs to be carried out. Like I said earlier, finding the source of the infestation is key, uh, and that is going to help to gain control of that pest issue quicker. Um, and then once you've gathered all this information, you'll have a good idea of areas uh, where you'll have proofing areas, you'll have housekeeping areas, and you'll have areas that will need to have control fitted um, and areas that will need to be um, monitored you know, in case there's any migration or movement of them pests. Risk assess. Don't forget to do your risk assessment. Um, look at the treatment location. So have a good look around the site. Don't just look at, say, maybe the room you're going to treat or the area you're going to treat. Have a look around the vicinity to make sure that there's not any risk uh, to anything else. Look for any non-targets or non-target habitats and try and stop that exposure. So, you know, if you've got things like pets, try to have them remove the pets from the property. Um, if there's people working there, you may have to do it out of hours, but try to, you know, uh, stop that exposure where possible. Follow-up procedures. So there's a number of factors that may affect your follow-up procedures. Things like your sales level agreement with your customer, um, they may specify uh, certain follow-up procedures in there. Um, products may have specific follow-up instructions. Um, things like monitors may have a use-up time. So pheromones, um, you know, some pheromones only last for a couple of weeks and they need to be replaced. Um, so you'll need to make sure that your follow-ups fall in line with them. It may be the risk to the site. So if you've got like a high-risk food site, um, you may have to do more regular follow-ups to that site uh, to make sure that infestation is being controlled. Um, and it may be that you do lots of follow-ups at the start to get on top of it, um, and then they may tail off. So things like oriental cockroach, because their eggs can take you know, 12, 16 weeks to hatch, it may be that you carry out the initial treatment, you get on top of the problem, but you're still going to have to monitor it for them a few months afterwards to make sure that there's no um, you know, cockroaches emerging from Utheca that have not hatched yet. So plan out them follow-up procedures, and it's going to be specific to each pest. Um, preventing the infestation as well. Like I said, if you find the source, you can prevent it happening again in the future. Now, even if it's coming from a neighboring site, um, faulty drain, uh, fruit flies coming from a leaky beer pump, uh, fix that source, and hopefully that should solve the problem. Also, knowledge. A little bit of knowledge goes a long way. Um, attending training courses, maybe doing an identification course, they're always really interesting. Uh, and one thing that always helped me as a technician um, was my BPCA manual. I still have one on my desk uh, today, and I still take it everywhere. Um, but it's really handy, you know, if you come up with something that you've not seen before. And I used to teach a lot of technicians, um, and I used to say to them, before you go into a job, you know, if you've got a call out for cockroaches, maybe, have a quick read through your manual, just give yourself a bit of information. And then once you've got that information on board, it gives you a starting point when you go look at that, that job. Um, so whether you're new to the industry or you've been doing it years, if, you, if you're coming up with something that you've not been to for a while or you've not dealt with, you know, just do a bit of research on it before you go into that job um, and it'll give you a, a bit of a head start. Okay, habitat management then. So deny food and water, remove or relocate um, possible food sources, Things like temperature, if they can be adjusted, uh, may be helpful. So removing food and water obviously just makes the site less attracted to insects. Um, and it'll be easier on some sites than others, but even just reducing access to it or making that access difficult, you know, could go a long way in helping deter pests in the future. Uh, things like, um, you know, covers over cake stands, um, you know, always helps with uh, preventing that problem in the future. Uh, and another one, um, uh, one that I, I spoke about the other week, uh, was barrels that have been stored upright who are getting stagnant water on top. 
if you just lay them barrels on the side, you then don't get stagnant water. You're not going to have any problems with mosquitoes and things like that. Also, having a structured approach to cleaning. Uh, it may, some areas may need cleaning more regularly, especially if it's an area that's going to have high chance of spillages. Um, you know, that area might want, might want a more regular cleaning routine. And you can do trend analysis on this. You know, if you've got like a national contract or a, a large site, um, you know, do some trend analysis on areas that you get problems uh, and document it. It may be that that customer has lots of sites that are having the same problems um, and you may be able to solve all the issues uh, just by doing a bit of trend analysis on, you know, this area is normally a problem. This is what we've done about it. Um, do you have this problem anywhere else? So keep an eye out for things like that, especially for sites that have you know, multiple uh, buildings that they look after. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> removing harbourage and housekeeping then, just a bit more on this. So debris and things like that, trying to remove it before the problem uh, is a problem. Uh, obviously gives you a better chance in not having that problem in the future. Rubbish, keep on top of rubbish. It's always a common one in summer, especially for flies and things. Uh, people get a buildup of rubbish in the bins. Um, you know, it, it may be that then bins need more regular emptying in summer um, or more regular cleaning. Look for water sources. Again, uh, if you're getting problems with mosquitoes, look for them water sources. And vegetation. I looked after a hospital once and uh, they had insects in the vegetation, but they actually had parasitic wasps then feeding off them insects. And this was next to a kitchen. And the parasitic wasps were actually getting into the kitchen um, and they were uh, getting wrapped in the food in the sort of the packaging line. Um, so it may be that the vegetation is causing a problem for outsides. So look for that as well. Uh, like I mentioned, regular cleaning. Um, and don't forget about inspecting goods in. It might be that you've got a problem, but it might not be that site. It might be coming from you know, a distributor or a neighboring, uh, a neighboring site where goods come in from. Um, so make sure you're inspecting them goods in for any pest issues. Proofing, so simple things like closing windows and doors. Again, is going to stop pest issues getting into uh, the property, and that's a preventative measure that you could do before there's even a, a problem. Um, you know, closing the windows and doors just stops it. Uh, mesh panels, again, insects going through like air vents and things like that. You can use mesh panels, um, air bricks. I did lots of uh, treatments in the past where we've had to cover air bricks um, to stop insects getting in through them. Fly screens, uh, so these can be on windows and doors. Uh, I used to like the solid fly screens for doors. It covers a dual, dual purpose because they're quite well fitted. It will stop insects, but it'll also stop rodents and things getting in as well. Um, so solid fly screen doors can sometimes be an advantage over a, a strip curtain, say. Um, and the mesh size is slightly different. So depending on what you are selecting a, a screen for, make sure you select the correct mesh size. Um, so normal fly mesh, I think is 1.2 mil, um, and then you can get midgy mesh, which is 0.6 mil. Um, so selecting that correct mesh uh, may stop pests getting in as well. Ceiling gaps around wall floor junctions, gaps in cavities. Um, these could obviously be potential harborage points, looking out for any sort of building defects uh, and sealing them up. A common one I used to find is harlequin ladybirds that were accessing uh, void spaces in properties. And they were getting in through silicon that was been, you know, degrades over time, uh, but the silicon around the windows, um, something like that could be a simple fix, but will stop a lot of future issues as well. Um, so looking out for them proofing issues. Non-chemical control. So you've got things like trapping. So fruit fly traps, um, you've got sticks. There are uh, things like demi diamonds, moth pots. You've got wasp pots as well. Um, so there's lots of options for uh, trapping. And every site will require a different, um, you know, technique maybe when it comes to when it comes to trapping. Uh, I remember once doing a job in a supermarket where they had a fruit fly issue, but the problem was the roof of the supermarket had collapsed um, and it was full of asbestos. So all the fresh produce went off, fruit fly got into it. We couldn't get rid of that problem. Um, and anything we could do there was to use some fruit fly, fruit, fruit fly pots. Um, and that was just to control the numbers until they got the asbestos sorted. So you know, every job will throw in a, a different sort of curveball um, and you just got to use these techniques to your advantage. 
Okay. Um, EFKs then. So again, great tool for monitoring. Um, can be used in kitchens. You can use them in void spaces for things like cluster flies. Uh, I have fitted one to a hospital once where they had cluster flies above the theatres. Um, and we fitted that with a large catch tray. Uh, and that was great for, for helping with the control of cluster flies in that area. Um, just remember if you're fitting them into void space and the things that you risk assess it because there can be issues with uh, fires and things like that. So just make sure that if you are fitting EFK units, that it's fitted in the correct way. Um, speak to your supplier about it if you're unsure, they will give you uh, more advice on that for individual products. Uh, sticky boards are great if you're using them in food areas where you don't want uh, fragments of fly to be able to you know, be dislodged or come out of the unit um, and contaminate any products. Heat treatment, uh, you know, this could be steam treatment. It could be single room or whole building. It is quite a specialized treatment um, and it does require some in-depth knowledge and some specialist equipment, uh, things like temperature probes for monitoring cold spots and things like that. Um, so there are heat treatments available out there. Uh, just do a bit of research on them. It's always helpful. You've also got freeze treatments. So museums use these a lot for fabrics and it can be anything from, you know, a, a domestic uh, freezer, if you put in um, you know, jumpers and things, you want to do a treatment, uh, you could use a domestic freezer or you could use a specialized uh, system for you know, larger items, carpets and things like that, museum pieces. Uh, there's a couple of variables with these. Uh, a lot of the time, the temperature of the freezer is important uh, because you uh, will need to vary your times that they're in there depending on what temperature the freezer will go down to. And it can be you know, up to two weeks for um, you know, freeze if it doesn't go very low in temperature. So moving on to some more uh, sort of things that we're going to use for control. Um, pheromones, pheromones are given off. They're a uh, tool that is used for external communication between insects. Um, so they give off a pheromone and other insects can pick them up and it's how they communicate. Four main ones, you've got the aggregation pheromone. Aggregation pheromones uh, attract insects to one area so like bed bugs they will give off an aggregation pheromone which is why you tend to find them clustered together um, they will obviously break off and create uh, other areas um, but that aggregation pheromone will keep them together uh, you've got sex pheromones um, and these are used uh, obviously for attracting in mating process um, and this is commonly used in sort of moth control uh, and there are a couple of different ways that these work there's pheromones that can flood the air to prevent you know, males finding females. And there's also ones that, um, you know, a male may land in a, a dust that's carrying the female scent. And then all the males will then be uh, attracted to that male because they think it's a female with that pheromone on him. Um, so there's a couple of different ways that they will work. Uh, you've got trail pheromones. These will be given off by ants. Obviously, Roger's ants is an odd one out because uh, that feeds off live insects. Um, but trail pheromones, again, if you've got ants coming into a location, it may be that um, you know, you could do some cleaning work and that may help prevent them finding that food source again. Obviously, don't just leave the food source there, um, have that moved as well. But doing that cleaning work could disturb that trail pheromone. Uh, and then you've got an alarm pheromone. And this is given off um, when there's either a perceived predator or you've disturbed something. Uh, insects will give off an alarm pheromone uh, as well. So that's pheromones. And like I say, we mainly use uh, aggregation one and aggregation could be used in traps as well uh, so a lot of traps will have an aggregation pheromone in it um, and sex pheromones uh, again to disturb the mating process we've got biological controls so what is a biological control there's two real ways of doing it you've got predator insects uh, and i used to look after a facility that um basically created these predator insects it'd be things like beetle that would then eat larvae uh, within a field. Um, I did go to a university once where someone released uh, crickets and they were actually using, um, I think it were geckos uh, to you know, control the crickets that have been released in this dorm. Um, so that is using a, a predator to uh, control an insect infestation. And then we've also got BTIs, which is a bacterium. BTIs is used in mosquito control. It comes in a block or grain form. 
uh, you basically put it on the water um, and the crystals are then ingested by the mosquito larvae. And then once it's in the gut, uh, the alkaline environment and the enzymes uh, in the mid gut that then releases the toxic toxins from the, the crystals. Um, it eventually leads the uh, gut cells to rupture. And normally this happens quite quickly within sort of four to 24 hours. Um, it starts to work really effective. Uh, doesn't affect anything else that's in there. Um, it only affects uh, the mosquito larvae. So why don't we use this very often? Well, BTIs you're only going to use for uh, mosquito uh, jobs. So unless you're controlling mosquitoes, you're probably not going to use BTIs. Um, and predator insects are not common uh, in the pest control industry just because the presence of the insect there in the first place um, is what's causing the problem. So just adding more insects uh, is not going to help solve that problem. Um, but just want to talk a bit about biological control uh, while we was on it. So moving on to some more sort of chemical controls that we're going to use and the products uh, and how they need to be, um, you know, the equipment we need to use to apply them. Um, when we look at chemical control, there's lots of factors that will influence uh, what you can use and how uh, you will treat a location. And it's finding that balance between the application technique uh, suitable for the location um, while also following the product level, label. And obviously, Kosh falls into this as well. Um, so, for instance, if you take a, a space spray, um, if you treat an Indian meal moth in a warehouse, uh, you know, under Kosh, it would be safer to use a ULV treatment because you can set that up remotely. Um, it can go off once the treatment has then been finished and the, the settling time has been allowed. You can go back in and retrieve that equipment. You're not exposed to anything. Um, that works in that situation. If you're doing the same with, say, cluster flies in a roof space, it may not be appropriate to put a ULV machine in a roof space. You know, it might be a floating ceiling, maybe. Um, so then you're going to look at things like uh, total release aerosols um, and uh, fogging treatments. Um, so yeah, every treatment you do, you may have a different application method for just taking them things into account. Um, sprays and dusters, make sure they're well-maintained. So make sure you service them. I've only ever had one occasion where a, a seal and a duster failed. Um, and uh, luckily I was, uh, sort of packing everything away. Um, but dealing with that, uh, you know, does take time. Um, so make sure things are maintained, make sure you look after equipment, clean out regularly, make sure you change them seals uh, and just make sure it's well maintained. Don't forget to follow the label. The label is law. Um, so for that product label, it will tell you what you can and can't do on there. Mix only what you need. So it, when you go into a property and you are carrying out insecticide work, make sure you know, you know the space that you are going to treat. So whether it's um, the volume for aerosol, ULV and fogging treatments, or if you're doing a, like a, 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 a spray treatment on, say, a carpet, know how big that carpet is or how big the area you're going to treat. And that will give you then your, um, your mix rate. So it will work out how much you can mix uh, to treat that area. Don't store mixed insecticides. Um, some of them will flocculate in a uh, sprayer. It will cause blockages. A lot of the sprayers have um, like filters in them. Um, and that was sort of a, a winter job was making sure the filters were clean and nothing could had clog that up um, you know, during the summer. Keep them well maintained and they tend to last forever. Um, but don't store it because it can cause you problems. Uh, and like I say, if you only mix what you need, you shouldn't have any excess anyway. And don't forget to follow RP and PP requirements. Read the product label. It will tell you what RP, RP and PP you need to use that product uh, and make sure you follow them requirements when you're using it. So IGRs, insect growth regulators, um, these are used in control of insects, but they don't necessarily control the insect. Uh, so it mimics the juvenile hormone and prevents the insect from completing a full life cycle. Uh, and some can infect the um, chitin, which is part of the insect skin. Uh, this is great for some insects, but you wouldn't use it on others. So insects like common clothes moth, um, it's the larvae that's doing the damage. So you don't want to keep them in a larval stage. Same with like variegated carpet beetle. If you were to spray them with an IGR, you'd keep that insect in a larval stage and it's the larvae that's actually doing the damage. Um, so you don't want to use IGRs 
on insects uh, where larvae is doing the damage. Common IGIs that you're going to see are methoprene and proxifen. Uh, this will be listed in the active ingredients uh, on the product label. So when you're reading through it, you'll see on there, it'll say uh, methoprene or preproxifen, um, and that is uh, an insect growth regulator. Uh, that is what it does. You've also got synergis. So common one you'll see is piprinol butoxide. Um, it is in some products, uh, so keep an eye out for it. Uh, piprinol butoxide basically stops the insect from creating uh, naturally an enzyme that breaks down the active ingredient. So the synergist itself has very little insecticidal action, um, but as the insect can't break down the active ingredient, this then makes the pyrethrins uh, active more enhanced. So it, it doesn't control them any quicker. It just stops the insect being able to break down that active ingredient in the first place. Um, so it's potentially going to work better. And we'll talk a bit more resistant uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, and that for, forms part of a, a resistance um, that can cause you issues. Uh, then you've got obviously your chemical controls and there's lots of active ingredients available um, and different products may contain things like synergists and IGRs. Um, but, you know, pyrethrins, pyrethroids, you've got IGRs, synergists, carbamates, organophosphates, um, and these can come in many different formulations. So wetable powder, emulsion concentrates, um, suspension concentrates, microlin capsules, granules. Uh, you can get dust, smokes, gels, aerosols. Um, they come in blocks, things like that. Uh, so yeah, you can get many different formulations of these active ingredients. Um, some insecticides, uh, sorry, some insects can create resistance to insecticides quite quickly. Um, so you may need to rotate these insecticides, especially with things like bed bugs. If you go to a treatment, um, you know, it may be on your next visit. If it's not working, you might need to rotate that insecticide uh, and use something else. Okay. Uh, insecticide resistance then. Uh, let's look a bit about insecticide resistance. There are four main ways that it comes about, um, and we'll go through these. Uh, I've just put letters on for them, but I'll discuss what they all are as we go through it. So you've got behavior resistance, and this is where the pest behavior fundamentally changes, so it avoids the pesticide. Um, it's also been known for insects like mosquitoes to not want to go internally into properties, um, and they'll avoid doing that, uh, obviously to avoid um, uh, being treated. Uh, but it doesn't occur much in uh, insects like bed bugs. Um, behavior resistance isn't as common. Uh, you've got penetration. So some insects um, will evolve a modification in their cuticle. This is what bed bugs will do. Uh, and this stops the insect from easily penetrating, um, sorry, the insecticide from easily penetrating that insect. Uh, so it just stops it from being able to be absorbed in through the cuticle. You've got detoxification, uh, and this is where the insect evolves elevated levels of particular enzymes. Again, talked about a synergist that would stop this, uh, which breaks down the insecticide very quickly, um, normally before it kills the actual insect. So you can treat it, the insect will naturally break down that insecticide and then carry it on. Um, and then you've got M, which is uh, the mutant site of action. So Let's take insecticides that would uh, affect the nerve cells. Um, that would actually mutate to prevent it being uh, attacked by the insecticide. So it would restructure itself so the insecticide can't bond with that, um, uh, with that molecule uh, and stop the signals from tr being transported through. Uh, so that's the four main ways that we have insecticide resistance. Okay, how do we get resistance then? So when you do a treatment, uh, you will treat a group of insects. Um, and then once that treatment has been uh, completed, you may still be then left with a few survivors. Uh, these may be resistant or they may be susceptible. You go back for your follow-up um, and then survivors have, have then uh, bred and mated and there are more um, infestation. When you treat it with the same insect, because that mutation has been passed on through generations, uh, that insecticide isn't going to work um, sort of moving forward on that treatment. And this is where you need to start rotating uh, your insecticides just to prevent that resistance becoming a problem. Um, and when you get good at it and you can spot the signs quite quickly, um, it normally helps with getting on top of infestations a lot quicker. 
excellent. That is it for that one. Let me stop sharing this. Okay. Uh, questions, any questions? Let's have a look. Uh, yes, David, it is being recorded. Uh, I think they take a little while, a couple of weeks for him to be put online. Um, but once they are online, uh, you can then go back and um, watch them again. Uh, okay, what do you see? What? So what do you do if you see honeybees on a site you are inspecting? Um, depending on the situation, if it's a swarm of honeybees, um, you know, just advise the customer that they're there, um, you know, stay away from them as it were, uh, and then uh, they'll move on quite quickly. If they are nesting there, it may just be a case of advising the customer what to expect. Um, and you know, if they need to do anything moving forward, chances are, you know, majority of the time they tend to just leave them um, and they'll go about their merry way. Depends what species of bees as well, because uh, like honeybees are going to be there for, can be there for quite a while or they can move on quite quickly. Um, things like the European tree bee may only be there for a few months while it nests and then it'll move on on its own anyway. Um, but yeah, uh, I think regarding any bees, uh, education is always best with the customer. Speak to them, give them uh, some advice um, moving forward. Just support them with it. Okay. Um, on slide two, you mentioned uh, rag flock and other filling materials. Can you repeat the end just to clarify? So rag flock and other filling materials, um, basically it's any... Uh, materials that um, are used for insulation purposes, let's say, uh, if they contain a pest, um, that would come under the rag flock and other filling materials. Uh, and the pest under that regulation is egg larvae, pupae, and any parasites. So um, if there were any parasites in there, that would be classed as a pest as well. Uh, so yeah, rag flock and other filling materials. Uh, if you need any more information on it, just uh, Google it and you can find it or give me a ring and I'd be happy to talk about it. Okay, so a question about um, Howard Bridge clearance on sites for customers. Um, if you were doing, so if you're on a customer site, um, I used to like doing clearances just because I knew what I was looking for rather than if they got someone in, they might just trim the bushes back type of thing. Um, so if it's something specific and you can do that work, then you know recommend it to be done to the customer and then see if you can do it yourself. Uh, if not, it may be they may need to outsource it. Uh, but just if they're having work like that done, when you go back for your follow-up, just double check that um, you know it's been completed and it's actually worked. It's not just been, you know, they've not just trimmed it back a little bit, but the problem is still there type of thing. Excellent. I think that's all of them for in there. Uh, 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 okay. Uh, there is a question about up and coming products and chemicals. Um, any up and coming chemicals will be announced by uh, manufacturing distributors. Um, and we normally have a press release if it's something that's coming out. Uh, and we try and have, you know, training days and things like that um, on the uh, forums, digital forums, uh, and in-person forums for any sort of new products. Uh, so keep an eye out for manufacturers for any uh, new chemicals that are coming out. Excellent. I think that's all the question. Oh, hold on. I can't see it because it's not popped up. Give me a second. Since losing Fendona for fly sprays, I've tried a number of other products. None of them are as effective as Fendona, uh, and they also smell a little. I'm now getting a lot of callbacks. I've done my checks on the sprayer. Um, ooh. Also based in Ireland, so have little products registered. Uh, speak to your supplier on that one. Um, if you've got a supplier for insecticides and... Uh, 
you know, it may be that um, Fendona uh, has been removed, but there may be a product similar uh, that may have replaced it or, um, yeah, it may be uh, available for you to use over there. Uh, so any anything on product-wise specific to your area, um, speak to your supplier and they should be able to give you some more information on it. Excellent. I think I'm done. Okay. Uh, thanks all for joining us today. Um, and like I say, I am back next month, 7th, on uh, Foggers and Your V Treatments. Uh, so hopefully see you there. Uh, have a good rest of your day and we will speak to you all soon. Bye. Bye.